As part of Virtual Bank Conference's ongoing mission to provide a forum for investors and banks to meet, Julian Casarino and I, Ian Green, are pleased to welcome Pete Johnson, CEO, and Laura Clark, CFO of Eagle Bank Corp of Montana, Opportunity Bank, to our Zoom interview table. EBMT presented a at our June conference and recently announced a merger with First Community Bank in Montana. For the next 30 minutes or so, we'll have a conversation about the merger and EBMT post combination. With that, I'll turn the discussion over to Julianne to discuss the pro formas and capital management. Okay, great. Well, thank you. So, so since the June conference, you guys have been busy. Um, you <laughs> you completed the Dutch tender uh, auction. Oh, actually, I should have started with my favorite thing you've done. You raised the dividend. Um, I thought meaningfully. Thank you very much yeah. for that. Uh, a lot of my my clients uh, genuinely appreciate that. So you raised the dividend. Um, reported strong earnings. Good quarter. Uh, good couple quarters actually. Um, completed the Dutch tender. Um, which although it didn't reduce the overall share count uh, that meaningfully, it did, however, um, uh, you know, make, make, uh, give you a good pot of option shares at no additional cost. So it was a cost effective or efficient way to, um, to do that. Yeah, so very active. But then the acquisition was the big news because it was a rather large acquisition. Um, there was some dilution and the earn back um, kind of over, over three years on an estimate. So um, I'd like to start with that. And um, if we could just uh, start with the numbers first, um, I'd just like to confirm uh, my pro forma estimate uh, numbers um, using the most recently reported quarter. Actually, I don't think first community, so I don't think the target has reported yet. Uh, last I checked, but okay. Uh, it doesn't matter actually, because you're acquiring a fixed amount of, of equity, acquiring a fixed amount of uh, 29 and a half million of equity. Uh, what was also unique about the deal is that the balance sheet marks um, that you disclosed as of the time of the announcement netted out to be a positive. So we had, uh, we had a, a write up in the fair value marked book value. Um, so, so using that again, the most recent quarter, and, uh, and the last estimates we have for fair value marks, I'm coming up with a tangible book value per share pro forma, the acquisition of 1838, which would mean the stock was, is trading today around 1.2 times that. Um, that would be around 6.9%, so just under 7% tangible book value per share dilution. I think in the um, presentation, it might have estimated higher than that. But since then, we've had some stock price appreciation and book value growth uh, from the earnings. Um, I'm estimating pro forma capital ratio of uh, tangible common equity to tangible assets of 8.8%. Uh, so again, just under 9%. And um, with the cost saves, uh, the cost saves expectation that you announced, um, I'm estimating a pro forma earnings per share of around $2.88, which would mean the stock is trading um, under eight times at 7.8 times that. And, um, and with a break even uh, of around four years, and I think you said it might even, I think the original estimates were for, for less than that. So um, the Delta is probably being in what you estimate for, for mortgage earnings. So do those sound um, a ballpark? Yeah. 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 Uh, yeah. Okay, yeah. great. Then maybe you can tell us about because, like I said, it's a big acquisition. It's a market expansion mm -hmm. into the eastern um, part of Montana, and um, you you must have you, tell us why it's uh, why it's so good. <laughs> yeah. Thanks, Julianne, and thanks, Ian. Um, yeah, glad to be uh, back visiting with you. Uh, yeah, first community. Uh, you know, the attraction there, there's, there's several things, you know, we always, when we're looking at merger targets, we look, you know, primarily at earning power and seeing if they're a good historical uh, earning bank. Um, and, and, and they, they have been, um, they, the other part about it is uh, there's, they have a very strong core deposit franchise. And, you know, although, you know, people have plenty of deposits these days, you know, in the long, you know, our, our vision of of the long term, you know, we, we know that the best way to build franchise value is to have a good 
good strong core deposit base. So that that was another attraction for them. Um, they that part of the state uh, we had entered that part of the state uh, in early 2020 with the uh, Western Bank of Wolf Point acquisition. So uh, we we. We knew, and, and even prior to the Wolf Point acquisition, we knew that uh, that part of the state uh, just has a lot of, you know, has a lot of deposits. It's got a, a strong ag economy. I think we highlighted in in our <clears throat> investor presentation that there's uh, the gross farm income in that region is about eight hundred million dollars. So, uh, so there's, uh, you know, it's it continues to add to our diversification of our ag. Exposure. Uh, you know, we, you know, we, you know, we started with the Ruby Valley Bank acquisition in southwestern Montana, added uh, Big Muddy, which was kind of the northern and central part, uh, and so this just puts us uh, as a major player up in in the northeastern part of the state. Uh, First Community has done a really good job developing uh, what we look for. You know, long term multi-generational relationships with with customers up there, good, strong uh, lenders. Uh, they actually have a fair number of good uh, young ag lenders too, which uh, young good young ag lenders are hard to find. So so you know their you know their needs were uh, you know, they were coming up against a lot of the same things that we we've heard from our other acquisitions. They you know technology needs, uh, technology staff, uh, you know hard to find. Um, and then also uh, there's the consolidation that's occurring in in the ag economy. Uh, some producers uh, uh, selling off to larger uh, producers, and 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 so you know banks, uh, you know the smaller community bank that's that's doing a lot of ag, they're potentially losing customers because they're 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 their needs are becoming greater than what their lending limit is. So, uh, so they were looking for somebody to partner with that that could help them uh, it kind of continue to serve those those larger ag customers uh, up there. So, uh, so that you know it's uh, you know that part of the state uh, you know population growth is probably not like it is in the western part of the state, but it does provide you know a good strong stable core funding. And uh, with our ability to use um, our our expertise in the Farm Services Agency lending, the FSA lending, we're the number one FSA lender in the state. We're a preferred lender. It does give us some uh, some options on working with customers. We can uh, we can do larger loans, but with a government guarantee, uh, the ninety percent guarantee, uh, we we sell that off. Uh, for night for a little premium, but we also have some nice uh, servicing income that comes comes along with that. So that allows us to package the, the FSA loan is a long term fixed rate loan. So we're able to by retaining only 10% of that. Uh, it, it doesn't give us too much duration, but it allows us to match it up with operating lines that are shorter term equipment loans. And so when we look at the at the in, the fee income from the servicing on that sold portion, as a package deal, they can, I mean, the yields on that can be uh, north of 7%. Yeah. So, uh, so being able to bring that to the table uh, for them, uh, we see as, as a plus and, uh, you know, we don't, we don't factor that into our model, but we, we do realize that we're probably going to see some revenue enhancements because of offering those kind of programs. They they do have a they do have a couple locations uh, in the western part of the state. They have a couple in Helena and one in Three Forks. So uh, they had expanded westward um, a number of years ago, uh, realizing that you know looking for areas that had higher population growth. So so those uh, those locations kind of fit right in our footprint, our existing footprint. So those those will be good as well. But okay. they're not yeah they're not as ag focused as as the their locations in northeast montana are you going to close those branches or well in in helena i think we have the opportunity to consolidate and uh they're they uh, probably net or probably uh reduce one there and possibly uh down the road in northeast montana be able to uh, reduce a, kind of a net minus one up there as well okay i noticed um in the fair value marks that you had a positive um, markup for mm -hmm. real estate. Um, mm -hmm. So if you were to close those additional branches, that one or two, would that be a potential additional uh, gain or? Uh, they... Yeah, poten potentially, yes, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay, I mean, on top of yeah. what's already. Right. Yeah, and, and uh, I mean that might be you know a year or two down the road. Right. Um, it's uh, you know sometimes bank bank branches aren't, aren't the easiest buildings to sell, but um, you know we we'll be we'll be utilizing them probably in the interim. So. Right. Okay. Okay. Um, and mm -hmm. uh, and so tell us it, it, tell us about population growth uh, in Montana. Um, so been, yeah, so over yeah overall Montana has seen really strong uh, population growth. I think it's probably been uh, nine or ten percent since the last census. I don't know that number off the top of my head, but uh, wait, uh, back in 1990 Montana lost a, a congressional seat, so we were down to one seat in the House. So uh, I think we're the first state that's ever gone from two to one back up to two because of our population growth. So. Uh, so we're seeing uh, growth really across our footprint. Uh, the Bozeman market that we're in, that that one, obviously, that's been a, a fast-growing market uh, for a number of years. Uh, but we're seeing a lot of in-migration in, in the other cities that we're in uh, as well. So it's, uh, yeah, it uh, it's really, you know, it's led to, um, you know, increased growth in our, in our residential mortgage business. It's, you know, obviously housing prices have gone up. Uh, as well. So uh, it's, yeah, we have, uh, it, it really, uh, you know, started, started before COVID, uh, but, but through COVID, uh, the Montana was seen as an attractive place to move. Uh, we kind of joke about, well, if you want a social distance, what better place to go than to Montana, where we have 2 million cows and 1 million people. So, um, uh, but. And, and good, and good internet service. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For the most part, yeah, we have good internet and cell coverage. So, yeah. Right. Okay, yeah. great, great. Well, it sounds mm -hmm. like a beautiful, beautiful place. Um, mm -hmm. The the pro forma stock ownership, um, the bank that you bought first, um, first community was largely mm -hmm. family owned. It's it looks like. Um, what will be the? Will there be? Well, first of all. Are their shareholders restricted from selling for any period of time? Is there a a, a blackout period for them? Uh, no, they they actually have a fairly diverse uh, shareholder base. Uh, oh. Laura, what was what was the number of their shareholders again? It's approximately two hundred and fifty um, okay. shareholders. Yeah, so there there's nobody. Uh, none of their shareholders will be at that five percent level. Okay. Um, at post you know, pro forma so um so there yeah so that's why we didn't feel the need to have any uh lock them up or anything like that lock they, up, right? uh, yeah yeah so they're um they uh you know they've been around for well over 100 years and uh their their shareholder base is multi-generational as well and that was part of the discussion uh i think that they had internally is they had you know a lot of shareholders that had uh you know family members had moved away and uh didn't have the same uh connection to the bank they were looking for some more liquidity and you know our ability to give them uh, a stock that's you know currency that's traded on nasdaq that was that was certainly attractive to them okay all right so uh, so pro forma there won't be any um concentrations of of no. ownership uh even with groups okay all right, right. and um the pro forma deposit franchise. Um, I just want to highlight that I don't have it right in front of me. What's the pro forma interest free uh, mix, Laura? Do you remember? Um, yeah, the for just the deposits, it's um, sixteen um, cents. So it's six point sixteen basis points. Well, that's for the cost, right? For the cost of deposit, so really low. Um, mm -hmm. uh, low cost of deposit. So, so your cost of deposits isn't going to change much pro forma. For the right they had a little bit higher um cost of deposits than we did but um but really when you put it, put them together it's just a minor increase right right okay all right great well um yeah i am was there were there any other questions about the pro forma uh combined combined bank? no but i was uh, wondering you know in terms of your capabilities and your personnel um do you pick up some interesting, I, I know you have 
probably expansion, obviously, to the agriculture side, but uh, some talent, some systems, some things that they were doing very well that you might be able to integrate or, or products and services that you have that you'll be able to cross sell into their uh, uh, customer base? Uh, yeah, we, we always look um, in acquisitions to see if there's, uh, you know, processes or things that they do uh, or offerings they have that, that are better than, than us. Uh, one aspect is that um, they've been, so we're, uh, our core provider is Fiserv and they've been on Fiserv much, much longer than we have. So, so they actually have uh, some, uh, some key people there that have some, some great Pfizer knowledge that we're looking to, to bring on board to kind of help with. Um, and we have, a, we have a number of internal projects for products and services and processes that uh, we think they're going to be able to help us quite a bit on. Um, you know, we've got uh, similar, similar products uh, because of the, uh, those uh, similar cores, but there, there's a number of things that they just had put off um, that that we've already completed so uh, some of the online features and and things like that so okay all right um actually before we move on to the capital i wanted to mention so um uh did i mention the the, the pro forma roa and the pro forma roe mm -hmm. I, mm -hmm. I did yeah. okay so like 1.4 mm -hmm. almost pro forma roa um 15.7 right. percent pro forma roe um, the business mix will be changing. Um, you, you'll be getting on a lot more agriculture. Um, mm -hmm. Mortgage presumably won't be as large uh, in the mix, right? Yeah, they have. Yeah, they do have a, a mortgage operation, but it's not. Yeah, not nearly the size relative uh, that that we have. But it, it will be additive. But yeah, this this will get our on our loan mix. It'll get us up to twenty percent on ag. So yeah, so we'll start to have a little bit more exposure to ag. Right, and in terms of earnings, do you have a rough estimate how it's going to um, break out between mortgage, ag, and and then other you know non-ag banking? Uh, not specifically. I you know I think more mortgage is still going to continue. You know we, you know uh, you know looking at uh, our origination volume this year, it's going to be another record year. I mean we're going to hit probably about a billion in originations on mortgage. Uh, our estimate for next year, uh, just using our, our our legacy lenders, I mean we think it's going to see maybe about a twenty percent decline. I know there's some talk mortgage bankers associations looking at like 35 percent decline but we're uh you know we've we have a really strong team that focuses primarily on purchase activity this big glut of refi is still still going on but it's it's starting to starting to tail off a little bit so our current pipeline on the mortgage side is 55 percent purchase 45 percent refi and uh, so it's getting back closer to our normal which is about two-thirds one-third Okay. Uh, yeah. But yeah, this, this will allow, you know, you know, uh, outside of the mortgage area, I mean, uh, our commercial uh, side of the business still is going to be a big chunk of the, where the profitability comes from. For the profit, right, right. Yeah. Okay. Okay, great. Um, so just to, to move to capital for a second, again, it's been a big capital management uh, <laughs> uh, past couple months for you. Um, just yeah. can you, uh, first of all, do you have an existing buyback authorization in place now that the um, the auction is completed? Is there anything left? Yeah, yes, we we did a we we've always kind of we've always done a, a buyback authorization of like a hundred thousand shares every July, and so that that is in place. It's uh, you know based on where. Uh, things are at right now with our stock price and everything else. We're probably not going to be very proactive on on doing any buybacks. Uh, so, but we always like to have it in place just as a defensive measure. So. Well, I think I think it's smart, uh, smart mm -hmm. too, because you never know. You know, never know yeah. what opportunities might come by. Mm -hmm. um, so, so is that something? If an opportunity were to occur. Could you buy back stock until or before the acquisition is completed, or do you have to wait until uh, that's? Uh, yeah, we we could, but I really don't expect anything 
okay. to happen. Yeah, I mean, okay. it's you, what we've what we've tried to do in the last couple of years uh, is if we do hear about a, a shareholder that's got a block, we try to find. Uh, we have a number of investors that have told us, "Hey, if you." If you see some a block of shares come, we'd like to buy it. So I just try to connect um, seller and buyers together that way, and then we don't have to do the buyback. Okay, all right. And um, you mentioned on your call that M and A can continue on pace. Um, mm -hmm. So given that this was a, a new uh, kind of acquisition, you know, much bigger, new market. What are you um, looking at uh, today, or or what would be some things that you're not interested, for example, are 100 million asset size banks too small now to mm -hmm. be interested in? Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I, there it's, it's starting to get to the point where, you know, uh, we, we would be a lot more selective on uh, banks of that size just because, yeah, the uh, the the juice isn't as, as, as much uh, now for, you know, we're as we approach 2 billion, uh, 100 million asset size banks i mean it would depend on the situation i mean if it uh was the right it was the right franchise the right market uh you know we would I, we could certainly do do 100 million again but it does uh open us up to look a little bit higher up on the on the scale we, i mean there's still close to 40 banks left in montana so um there's there's going to be more opportunities uh in the future right uh, on the flip side, what would be um, kind of on the high side? What what would be a stretch on the on the high end? Um, well, yeah, I think the the high end would be like that half a billion range. Okay. That um, yeah. So, uh, but um, you know, we're always always open for new opportunities. So. Right. What about it? Um, what about filling in? Do you have? Um, do you think you have the density that that you're looking for uh, throughout, throughout particularly throughout the eastern uh, part of the state now, or um, or do you see more fill-in opportunity? Yeah, I, I think our preference would be to kind of fill in um, what would would have been our legacy uh, footprint. I think where I think we have a have a really good presence in northeastern Montana now, so I, I think you know that. Um, Kind of like that old what we used to call our i-90 corridor where we had a lot of our a lot of our locations any, anywhere between billings and missoula uh, you know fill in in the, in that area would be uh, would be desirable <clears throat> okay all right but probably not um not out of state no we're we're still focused on montana we we know we know the markets that you know that much better uh and um you know, there's, you know, we know, we know the markets, we know the bankers much better. So. Okay. All right. All right. Great. And um, yeah. And so we talked earlier about the pro forma capital ratio uh, being close to 9%, maybe, maybe even higher by the time uh, the offering mm -hmm. closes. So 9%, um, I mean, how low would you take that for, for an acquisition, no matter how compelling uh, it might be? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I, we're, we're comfortable um, at that at around eight percent at the at Eagle. I mean, the, the bank has has higher capital ratios and and uh, act, you know we actually manage you know manage the capital ratio at the bank uh, pretty closely just because that's the regulators' fo focus. Um, but uh, yeah, we you know I'm comfortable at eight percent at at the holding company. Okay. All right. All right. Great. Well. Um... Ian, maybe you could, uh, unless there was there another question you wanted to ask about capital, capital management? No, I think we're, we're pretty well covered that. I think that's great. Um, so I wanted to just step back into uh, agriculture and agricultural lending. It's an area that most of us bank investors you know, have very little experience with. And maybe you can um, give us a little primer on the uh, the pitfalls, the strategies, the opportunities in ag lending today. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, agriculture is is one of the top industries in Montana. So as we have grown over the last you know, seven eight years, we realized that if we were really going to be a statewide uh, 
company that we needed to 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 find a good fit for uh, agriculture in in our in our bank. So uh, and so that's why it's it's uh, it's been partly uh, coincidence, but partly by design that our acquisitions have have been primarily ag banks. Uh, you know, we were becoming pretty heavily concentrated in commercial real estate uh, and and really didn't want to have all of our eggs in that basket. Uh, ag banks historically uh, have been very profitable um, in Montana. They, you know, a lot of these have, are like the, um, the only financial institution in the area. They have some good pricing power. Uh, ag, ag loans um, historically have a little higher higher return. Um, there is a, there is more um, cyclicality or volatility, I guess, in, in ag. And so you have to have the, uh, the historical uh, relationship with, with the customer, you know, the lender and the customer have to have that historical relationship because there are going to be good times and bad times in ag. And, and that's really just due to uh, mother nature. I mean, there's, uh, you know, you, you know, and, and the other, you know, by design, we've also, you know, wanted to make sure that our, um, our, our ag portfolio is, is diverse across the state. So we have, you know, uh, we're not con heavily concentrated in one spot in Montana that just does like, say, just winter wheat or something like that. So, so we have sections, I mean, the, the bulk of our, of our uh, ag book is, is in cattle. That's probably about 40%. Uh, of our book, uh, but you know Montana is a is a large um, cattle producing state, but we also have um, you know uh, you know areas that are primarily alfalfa and hay, and then you have areas that are winter wheat, areas that are spring wheat, and different types of things. So uh, so so our you know we don't have any you know some of the you know a year or two ago you know the the big concerns were around uh, dairy and soybeans and corn, and those just aren't. Uh, areas that you know Montana is not a dairy state. We don't do corn. We don't do soybeans. It's very heavily uh, cattle and and different varieties of wheat and then hay hay crop as well. So uh, so but it you know it's it's interesting because you can have um, one uh, op farm operation uh, and next to another one. One gets hit with hail and one doesn't. Yeah, one gets rain at the wrong time, one gets it at the right time. So, so, uh, and that's where, you know, we really, uh, you know, rely on our ag lending team that's that's been doing this for a long time uh, to kind of help manage those relationships. So most of our, by far, most of our operators have a lot of equity uh, in their operations. They're not, they're not highly leveraged or anything like that. So they're, you know, they've come through good times and bad times and always been able to turn a profit. So, well, that, uh, that brings up another question. So when we say ag loans, uh, what are we lending on? Are we lending uh, with collateral on the farm, on equipment? What, what's, or is it all of the above? Yep. So, yep. Good question. So, uh, so a lot of it is, is based is, is collateralized by, by the acreage. So, um, you know, a lot of these operations have, you know, a few thousand acres or, or whatever. So, so a lot of, a lot of good collateral coverage there that, but then you also have, and those tend to be, you know, uh, those are the longer term. And that, typically we look to do the FSA guarantees uh, on those loans, um, uh, because that's what FSA will primarily work on, on, uh, farmland. Uh, but then you have operating lines, so uh, operator has to buy um, 100 head of cattle, so they need you know, they got to use their operating line to 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 buy uh, increase their herd, and then they'll pay it down when, at the end of the year when they're selling off their herd. And then you also have equipment loans, uh, whether it's new tractor, uh, other equipment. Uh, so those are also kind of short term loans. So so it's the way that our book kind of shakes out it's about half and half so you've got some that's the land and then some that's operating lines and but each i mean each operator we, we're you know they're going to have a combination so it's not like we have only operating lines to one person and only land loans it's typically a combination of those uh and that's where we do we look at the mix and if we can get that uh, fsa guarantee in there and do some short-term 
uh, operating loans, the blended uh, maturity is about three years and the blended rate with the servicing fees is north of six or seven percent. So that's kind of our secret sauce on, on the ag side. And do you have a loan to value target that on these loans? Um, you know, it's not quite the same as on, on commercial real estate because uh, it can vary quite a bit. But, you know, we tend to keep, uh, you know, I would say, you know, generally speaking, it's probably below, well below 70 percent on loan to value because uh, then you start getting into an, in, uh, an instance where they've they only get to that high level if they've. Uh, that highly leveraged if they've had a number of years of losses where you have to kind of have carryover debt and things like that. So, yeah. Now, do you require uh, crop insurance and those sorts of um, <coughs> programs? For you know? Yeah, for the most part. Um, Laura did some digging on our crop insurance information. Yeah, yeah and um, we typically um, our lenders will make sure that the crop insurance is intact um, when we're uh, lending. So, yeah. Now in, in New York, or at least my experience here, uh, Farm Credit uh, Bureau is a big competitor to, to banks. Uh, do you have the same structure in Montana? Yes, yes, Farm, farm Credit, um, yeah, they're the, they're the they're the ag version of credit unions where they 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 take their ability the fact that they don't pay uh, income taxes or much income tax to offer much lower rates so it's a and that's why we use that FSA program because that does allow us to compete on long term uh, debt uh, but farm credit is if yeah any ag lender in in Montana you ask them who their toughest competitor is it's farm credit. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'm, it, I'm, I imagine, or I'm, I would guess that your capabilities with this merger, having local knowledge in the areas has got to be a, a plus. I know Warren Buffett always talks about that. If you can have local knowledge, uh, that's oh. a great di differentiator. Oh, definitely. Yeah, yeah. You, yeah. We don't do, uh, you know, we don't do these kind of deals unless we're retaining, retaining that knowledge base because uh, that, that is key. Um, so, uh, for, for us investors who are, are tracking, uh, cause you're, you'd have a significant book of business with that. What sort of metrics would be available for us to say, oh, well, we don't have to worry about, you know, EBMT's, um, you know, agriculture book because the statistics for ag is looking really good or, mm -hmm. you know, so where, where might we look to find what's happening there? Is, is there a, a source or? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like the opposite of mortgage, right? Where there's a, a plethora <laughs> of industry data that we track, but um, it's like a dearth, a dearth of uh, data for ag. Yeah. Is there a Montana farm income statistic that the state puts out or something like that that we know? Oh, I, I don't know. Laura, Laura's got some general guidelines, I guess. Maybe she can share. Yeah. Um, the. Some of the information that our chief credit officer tracks is the um, wheat and corn prices. Um, not that we have a lot of corn um, production here, but um, but the wheat prices tend to follow or lag behind the corn prices. But they kind of, if corn prices go up, then um, wheat prices are tend to go up. Um, and then and the other one. What's that? I'm sorry if I can just ask about that. If you're, is that a, because you're you're doing cattle, a lot of it's cattle lending. Aren't they eating the wheat and corn? Is that, is are higher prices good or or bad for a cattle uh, borrower? For the borrower, for our borrowers, it's probably not good to have the corn prices go up because okay. they're probably feeding it. Right. Um, so you want yeah. lower prices would be yeah because we're not selling okay. the wheat prices are going up to help our borrowers but of course yeah 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 hay hay yeah. price hay and alfalfa pricing is probably more uh more closely yeah. aligned to the inputs for cost for cattle producers because what um you know the corn comes into play once you send it off to the feedlot or whatever like that so okay. our producers are 
feeding, you know, either grassland or or hay, uh, and uh, so you know, hay hay prices aren't as widely uh, known. Uh, I don't think like wheat or corn. But. I imagine cattle prices would be good to follow too. So, right. Yeah. yeah. Just, just a quick question: the, the the corn prices, I guess, the corn and wheat, are those nationwide? Or are they state specific? No, they're they're pretty national. I mean, they're yeah. they're. In, I mean, um, you know, so so, uh, you know, they're they're entering into contracts with uh, with large uh, national uh, groups that are that are buying. You know, the, whether it's winter wheat, uh, spring wheat, Durham, uh, you know, uh, barley. You know, so it, yeah, they're 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 pretty much a national market for that. And and same with cattle prices. I think it's a pretty uh, cattle prices are fairly easy to find, uh, too, but, uh, and I'm, I'm sure I, and I, I, I know I've seen, um, uh, trying to remember there is a, the state of Montana does have, have a website that shows a lot of, um, uh, farm income statistics. I'd have to kind of dig around and, and see where, where that is, but I know we've looked at it by county, uh, in the past when we're looking at, at different acquisitions and things like that to kind of see what is, uh, the primary, you know, driver in, in those, in those areas. So there, it is out there. It's just a little harder to find. Right. I see. Well, and Laura, were you, I, I asked about if, if it was a good or bad, the prices, but I think you were about to, were you about to say something? Oh, I, I was also going to say that um, the cattle prices is also oh. another um, monitor that I am, I am beat me to it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> and and just out of just out of curiosity, I would I would imagine, although I don't know, that cattle is is less cyclical than um, than than dairy or or I, I don't is, is that true or no? Well, really, the cyclical um, part of the cattle business is um, they sell the cattle the um, cattle in the fall and then they. Um, you know, they're um, calving in the spring, so uh, February, March. So it's kind of it is seasonal in that manner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It really, I mean, it it does get affected by like global demand for for beef and, and things like that. So um, you know, so Montana, uh, you know, the our state officials are always you know uh, very eager to make sure that we've got. Uh, you know, good connections, uh, you know, for a lot of times it's, um, you know, uh, Korea was a big uh, source uh, or, or a good location. So, so we're always trying to make sure that we have those global uh, contacts because if, if we're not delivering the beef that is coming from somewhere else, South America or, or wherever, so. Right, right. Just one, la one last real quick question about, about the acquisition, pro forma earnings. Have your earnings become more, more, more variable now because of the higher ag, or do you not see see that? Is it... No, I mean the you know ag earnings. I mean there even though there's cyclicality to everything. I mean the the earnings. Um, you know we've you know we've been fortunate. We we haven't had any credit issues. Uh, or significant credit issues on the ag side, so that that's really the the area where you're going to see the volatility. If there were a couple of down years, and uh, you know people were really struggling, but okay. Well, I guess that uh, will wrap up our conversation. Thank you and appreciate your time and your insights. Um, we'll be emailing this video to our database of investors. If you're not on our database list, please contact us. We'll also be posting this interview to our website, www.virtualbankconference.com. Thanks, everyone. And, and your presentation will be there too, the slide deck uh, for the merger.